ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back your host, Brad Behrens. Hello, hello. Oh, it is on. Excellent. All right. Well, who, uh, raise your hand if you've been to the floor. Who's been to the, well, that's a lot of you. Excellent. All right. Well, we've got an exciting afternoon uh, ready for you. A um, couple of housekeeping announcements. Uh, remember, I talked about this this morning during the opening. We have the pub crawl, and it's starting at 4.30. So uh, grab your mugs and uh, prepare to weave and, and wander, and you'll be weaving more as you go past. Uh, and then it's uh, at the end of the pub crawl, come right back here because we're going to have the Tainted Love concert, which is going to be uh, all sorts of 80s kinds of fabulous. So it's going, to be, it's going to be an awesome night. Thank you for coming. We've got people, hurry up, because we've got a lot of people coming in, which is great. Um, a couple of things uh, I want to talk about before we bring out our speaker, and that is that there is just a whole lot of alphabet soup in this industry. And you know you have to have a pretty high IQ to tell the difference between a DSP and a DMP. And when a VIP at your company asks if RTB is relevant, you better have an answer of PDQ. And it's just really confusing for a lot of people. So when we hit that saturation point of complexity and confusion, there's one person that we all turn to, whether in person or through the Loom Escapes that we uh, we have, I mean, we have them blown up at the ad tech offices, and it show, charts the industry that we serve. Uh, and that man is Terry Kawadja. And Terry Kawadja is the founder and CEO of Luma Partners. He's been an investment banker for uh, 20 years. He has, and Luma focuses on the intersection of technology and media and advertising. And he is um, he's advised on $300 billion worth of transactions in this space. So he really knows. Uh, he knows what's happening, he knows what has happened, and he's here to talk to us about what's going on now and what he predicts is going to be going on in the future. In addition, by the way, to, to his day job, he's also uh, a part-time comedian and songwriter, so we can have high hopes for the entertainment value uh, of what you're about to see. But, but again, there's nobody better uh, out there at explaining to us um, how this crazy industry is fragmenting and then recombining and then fragmenting again. And good news for all of us in this room, because this is what pays the bills, always growing. So let's give a big ad tech welcome to Terry Kowadja. Come on out. All right, thank you, Brad. Well, thank you, Brad. It's, uh, it's awesome to be uh, here at ad tech. You know, I was, uh, I, I suspect like many of you, um, on, uh, on Sunday at 10 o'clock, I was tuning in for the uh, third show of the new fifth season of Mad Men. And, you know, I'm just such a huge fan of the show. I thought I'd borrow a little bit of, uh, uh, a little bit of Don Draper uh, today to help me get a few uh, points across, in part because um, I love the show and in part because, you know, the backdrop of uh, John Hamm is probably a lot better than, uh, than uh, PowerPoint. So here we go. Um, it's Mad Men, only a little advanced to uh, 2012. We're going to talk about the uh, advertising technology landscape, uh, opportunities and challenges. And, and by that I really mean the good news and the bad news about sort of where we are today, the complexity and what the, uh, what the future uh, holds. So uh, let's, uh, let's think about it in terms of, well, let's see, we got the show and there's five seasons now into the show, and like that, uh, many of the presentations that uh, we've put on, including the uh, Lumascapes, have gone through their same sort of gestation. And uh, we had originally, we had, I know, it's kind of spooky to me too. Um, we, we had, you know, the origins of uh, the Lumascape, which actually dated back to, in a prior version, to 2005. But in its current version today, we sort of debuted that in early uh, 2009 at a, a conference at the, uh, at the IAB. Of course, that evolved, and, and about two years ago, I gave a presentation at the IAB's Networks and Exchanges Commission that talked about really the evolution um, of the entire ecosystem and, and really sort of did a ground up you know, building of all the different players and then made some prognostications in terms of things like Google coming into this uh, environment uh, very with full force, uh, the importance of first party data, uh, the importance of publishers uh, taking advantage of the technology as opposed to just um, advertisers. Fast forward to season three, if you will, um, and um, the presentation of the scientification of media 
introduced, obviously updated the chart. Um, by, uh, by now, uh, we had, uh, I had left the confines of Sterling Cooper and started Sterling Cooper Draper Price, uh, Luma Partners, um, and uh, we came out with a presentation that talked about how, uh, among other things, the, uh, this this, this data-rich in data rich world that we live in enabled all kinds of interesting things to happen, like a collapse of the purchase funnel, uh, like uh, multiple uh, channels uh, of use of, of this data, not just in display advertising, hinting that there were much bigger and broader opportunity sets for this universe that we, uh, that we, uh, that we live in. And then further, um, last year in 2011, we talked in a a presentation called uh, Clash of the Titans about the coming dominance of four major players, and you're familiar with them. I think there's a session on them later on, um, Apple, Facebook, uh, Google, and Amazon being four companies with such a rich data pool of their own that they'll be able to have pretty strong controls over what we call the uh, open internet. And then finally today, again, the, the Lumascape is always uh, morphing and changing. We're uh, adding companies and denoting uh, consolidated companies. So there's been this, uh, this broad evolution. Here's a snapshot of the uh, early 2009 version of the Lumascape. It was actually originally done on a legal piece of paper because it, it didn't fit, but I uh, figured we needed to, uh, to shrink it down. Obviously, a lot uh, fewer players than a very uh, much earlier incarnation. Interestingly, as we started publishing these, you know, many other uh, firms, including investment banks, started uh, you know, duplicating them, do, using their own sort of advertising technology uh, landscape charts. And it was kind of funny because, you know, I, I suppose um, imitation is the best form of flattery, but they were going so far as to just basically copy what we had done and then just put their uh, logo on it. So I decided to have a little bit of fun. I'll let you in on a joke. In December of 2010, I thought I'd have a little bit of fun with this, so I put a fake logo on the chart, a company that just didn't exist. I went to logomaker.com and I made a logo up and lo and behold, three different firms posted. Here's an example, here's one of them, and if you look closely, there's AdPro, ladies and gentlemen, does not exist. Um, so then I decided in every single Lumascape to put that little kernel, that fake company, in every single Lumascape, and sure enough, they get duplicated. I think we're beyond that now, but it's just a little bit of fun. So uh, here we are today. The, the, uh, the Lumascape, in terms of stats, this is pretty uh, crazy, over 300,000 views um, of this Lumascape, since we've uh, posted it to SlideShare, from, if you can believe it, 116 countries. What are they doing in Mozambique about display advertising? I don't know. Or, or Mongolia, or Afghanistan, or Iraq, or Iran, for that, for that matter. Um, it's been covered, obviously, in the major uh, uh, media, um, but and, and, and we've been contacted by at least six authors who put it in books, and, and I can uh, also now, I got a uh, I appreciate the fact that uh, it's now part of a Harvard Business School case study, so I can now tell my dad I got into Harvard. Um, and of course, it's ubiquitous in conference presentations. I'm sure you've, some of you have played, you know, uh, Lumascape Bingo. It's just a matter of time until someone mentions it, but it's in board decks and slide decks and investor presentations. But most importantly, uh, and this is where sort of w w the whole reason why we form these, it's in M&A strategy docs. So virtually every major media, marketing, and technology company has this, you know, up on their walls, in their M&A war rooms, as they think about options, inorganic growth options uh, in the space. And that's where we spend a, a lot of our time, helping them sort of sort through uh, those opportunities. In fact, the Lumascape, you know, if Don saw the Lumascapes today, and by the way, you know, we sort of decided to brand it Lumascapes on the eve of publishing them in uh, June of, of last year. And of course, there's now seven uh, Lumascapes covering each of display, search, social, video, mobile, commerce, uh, and gaming. And there's uh, more, uh, more coming out. But the whole purpose of this was to try and, and, and graphically show the complexity and the interrelations of companies and some sort of rough grouping about uh, capabilities or, or, um, or components of these industries and how they were uh, interrelated. Obviously, these things are not perfect, um, uh, but I think they are a good sort of starting point in terms of a dialogue of what does the industry look like, and of course, that's only static. The really interesting part is where are we going, which is, I think, what we're going to get into here in a minute. 
So um, yes, uh, the complexity does breed the need for you know, some kind of help to sort this through. If you, if you think about a traditional media company looking to get into uh, you know, digital, you know, it's, it's a daunting uh, task. And they obviously, in, in the world of old media, you could overpay for an asset and, and by 20% and, and, uh, and not worry about it. Your IRR would be a little bit lower. Uh, in digital, I like to say there's 100 cents of downside. And so it's very important that they, uh, they get it right. Um, and we spent a lot of time there. So I'm just going to quickly go through the various uh, Lumiscapes that are, that are up there. I'm not going to, uh, I mean, we could spend a whole uh, hour on each one talking about all the interrelations and what's going on and what the future looks like. But I will tell you that, you know, in display, the sort of the most mature uh, market as it relates to this complex uh, ecosystem, um, we've seen, you know, obviously the first thing you think of is uh, fragmentation, right? There is over, 300 logos on that slide, and that's only representative. There are many other uh, companies that exist that deliver some form of solution to either the advertiser or uh, the publisher. Interestingly, this fragmentation has bred a tremendous amount of innovation. I mean, we have seen in the matter of just a few years a huge growth in the sophistication level of targeting, of optimization, of analytics that are building the sort of uh, building blocks, the groundwork, if you will, for a lot of opportunities uh, in display advertising. And by the way, that has helped fuel significant growth in the display advertising sector. It's growing much faster than search uh, and, um, and implications for the other uh, sectors. Again, innovation drives growth uh, and, and opportunity. Of course, there's a flip side to that. There's a lot of players on this chart. Clearly, this is not a mature industry. And we'll talk more about uh, consolidation and standardization and simplification um, as, we, uh, as we go on. But, but the, the, the kernel here is really the outset of this. The, 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 the driving force was the shift from contextually sold uh, media uh, to audience sold media. And a lot of the ramification in terms of uh, uh, technology providers uh, in and around data, in and around targeting, all help fuel that uh, ecosystem. We've got, of course, search. Search is not going away. It's still a substantial uh, industry, continues to grow. And we're now seeing innovation around uh, areas like you know, content distribution uh, through search. There's some uh, fascinating things going on, despite the fact that we have several players that control a substantial proportion of the spend, at least at the search engine uh, level. So it's, it's certainly a less fragmented uh, universe than, than display. Social is an interesting uh, area because of the nascency of the entire subsector. There's really only a few uh, billion dollars worth of spend, and one company, Facebook, uh, happens to be grabbing uh, the lion's share of that. The interesting thing about social is um, this is all very new. And uh, unlike um, many of the spend in search and display, this represents the potential, and I emphasize the word potential, for sort of uh, uh, accomplishing a brand-oriented uh, or upper-funnel-oriented uh, uh, advertising goals. So this is going to be an interesting one to watch. Clearly, very fragmented. Uh, we have an efficient venture capital uh, industry where, you know, if there's opportunity, funds go to ideas, and ideas spurn uh, companies. Uh, we have obviously have too many uh, players here, but that's OK. We're in the early innings, and we'll see a lot of innovation, and then hopefully a rationalization um, of the space as it, uh, as it matures. Uh, video. Uh, unlike in social, uh, video, also a small couple billion dollar industry in terms of online video, but here the opportunity is to grab share from a already established massive amount of dollars spent in television, right? 70 billion plus spent in TV, and eventually the TV and all connected devices will be delivered or d capable of being delivered over um, IP. And therefore, you're going to see a melding of what is online, what is over the top, what is linear. The whole reason why we put all of those players, including the traditional players, on this slide was to capture that very fact that what these companies are going after is that, is that great, big, uh, great big pie. And again, full motion video, this is the opportunity for uh, brand dollars, uh, which again, heretofore, uh, digital has not, has not demonstrated well. 
mobile. Uh, hey, they're saying 2012 is the year of mobile. Uh, if I had a dollar uh, for every time they said that, I'd have about $15 um, uh, for every year. Um, so, uh, although, you know, look, there, there's, there's obviously the world is moving to mobile devices, and mobile, the whole definition of mobile is changing. It used to be your cell phone. Now, of course, the proliferation into smartphones, tablets, and connected appliances and devices. Heck, your television could be considered a mobile uh, device in the future as it's uh, Wi-Fi enabled. So, yes, there's a lot of opportunity here. Still a lot of fragmentation. Still not a lot of size in mobile specific, but obviously, you know, the opportunity is very large. And if the millennial media IPO is any indication, public investors are dying for the opportunity to participate in what they think will be um, the future of all digital across mobile uh, devices. Uh, commerce, uh, clearly at the bottom of the funnel, we've seen all kinds of companies, and this is an interesting area because it represents sort of the perfection of advertising, right, getting all the way to the bottom of that funnel, and what's interesting is that in this, you know, it used to be fairly disconnected between discretionary advertising spend and e-commerce or retail sales. Uh, with this data world that we live in now, the, and, the, and the connection between offline and online data, we're actually tying that closer together. That's that sort of collapse of the purchase funnel uh, I referenced uh, earlier. And that gives you know, opportunity for all kinds of data-driven opportunities around marketing that drive uh, you know, potential customers to become actual uh, customers. Uh, a lot going on here, and obviously uh, some of these you know, companies and some of these business models are really uh, being put to the test uh, today. And gaming, uh, gaming is yet another sector. These is a, you know you sh you should think of gaming uh, as a media channel. Yes, clearly they're selling this um, on uh, a lot of mobile devices. They're they're getting payments uh, directly as opposed to relying on advertising. But there's a huge uh, advertising opportunity as this usurps more and more of uh, people's time, especially uh, the young uh, people. And of course, the whole reason why we have this mass fragmentation is because we have this entire ecosystem of venture capital money that is extremely efficient at funding any idea that it likes or that uh, one of the other VCs funded and they want one in their portfolio. Um, there are hundreds upon hundreds of companies. This digital capital loom escape lays them out in terms of stage, stage, uh, sorry, um, uh, stage of investor, type of investor, and uh, geography, that's a good resource. By the way, all of these are available for download on the Luma Partners uh, website. And you know what's interesting, and Br uh, Brad referenced this earlier, we live in this world, especially in ad tech, where we use all these complicated uh, uh, acronyms and we, uh, this jargon, heavily loaded jargon to describe our companies. And, and so uh, I want to share with you something I made uh, a while back, but if you haven't seen it, you'll have fun with it. It's a, a typical potential conversation that might occur here on the floor at AdTech. I see that you are exhibiting here at AdTech. What exactly does your company do? We provide scalable advertising solutions to integrated demand-side platforms that deliver serious ROI. Wait, what does that mean? We have a SaaS-delivered solution that utilizes proprietary data to target and optimize media. I still don't understand what the hell your company does. Can you describe it in English? We use predictive modeling and real-time bidding to make exchange-based buys with complete transparency. You lost me. It's like you people are all talking in fucking code. <laughs> what is your company name? Adnosium. That makes sense. We are considering a funding round and have lined up Fred Wilson, Ron Conway, Chris Saka, Brad Feld, Peter Thiel, Chris Dixon, and Mike Walrath to invest. Holy shit. And we have some serious inbound strategic interest. The company is not for sale, but we have to consider our investors. I see. How old is the company? We launched the business as the 437th ad network six months ago, but have pivoted the model twice since then. So you are on your third business model in six months? We are completely on top of this dynamic marketplace. And how do you differentiate? We have an excellent position on the Luma Partners landscape chart and believe that will serve us well. That's it? That's your marketing strategy? What about those who think the ad tech space is overcrowded? There's more to digital than just advertising. We agree. 
which is why our game mechanics technology can be used for real-time video content distribution using social media across mobile SDKs to target local consumers from the cloud. Wait, did you leave out any pathetically obvious buzzwords? No, I don't think I did. So I have to ask, are you interested at a $75 million pre-money valuation? $75 million? Are you fucking kidding me? You are wasting my time. I need to know that you are with me. Fill or kill. What will it be? Okay, okay. Put us down for $20 million. That's my bitch. So, you see that sort of gives you a little bit of a flavor of sort of what's going on in the, uh, in the VC world that we, uh, that we live in today. Um, and, and you know, this, this, this whole ecosystem explosion of audience bought media on exchanges using, you know, data uh, about audiences in, in real time. This is, I mean, you know, who, who knew this would be the case, even, even not, that, uh, not that long ago. Certainly, certainly Don wouldn't, wouldn't have thought of it. But there is obviously, you know, great opportunity. And it's amazing to me, the IDC study recently came out projecting the level of, this is just RTB, this is real time bidding of inventory on exchanges and showing that not only will in three short years, and by the way, uh, RTB did not exist in the year 2009. Um, so, so this is really a nascent uh, um, development. That in, in three short years, we will see over $5 billion of spend in, in being, of media being bought in real time, which represents 25% of all display advertising and almost two thirds of all indirect channels. So besides what the sales force sells directly, this could be the lion's share of indirect ad sales. That's gonna have a significant um, implication on various other players in the marketplace because not everyone is sort of RTB uh, capable. Um, and some, like agencies, have responded by developing agency trading desks where they sort of um, help their clients you know, manage these different technology providers and help funnel the spend uh, in this sort of new, uh, new channel, new category. Well, that's on the, that's on the demand side. On the, on the supply side, you know, you've got um, publishers that are looking at this development, and some of which are like deer in the headlights and saying, gee, does RTB stand for race to the bottom, or can we actually leverage this to our uh, advantage? Um, and, I, and I will say that um, I think there is this, there has been this um, sort of false assumption that when people uh, talk about you know, media bought on exchanges, they, they sometimes make derogatory references to the low pricing, the CPMs of like $1.25 on average on exchanges and say, geez, isn't that, isn't that terrible? Isn't that just sort of, you know, a bottom of the barrel kind of inventory that's being placed in these channels? Well, I'm afraid that argument confuses uh, correlation with causation. The reality is it is a new channel. Uh, three years ago, the average price was probably one-tenth of that, about 12 cents. And so it's come a long way, tenfold, and I would argue that as more and more publishers get comfortable with this new environment, this new marketplace for their inventory, that we will continue to see uh, that rise. Not only in terms of spot bought, but also what I'll call pro programmatic premium. So if you think about the inventory in a publisher, they crudely break it into two groups. There's tier one, what your direct sales force sells, and there's tier two, everything else, uh, or uh, most commonly referred to as remnant. Well, it turns out that in a world where you've got the kind of uh, uh, data capabilities to determine who the audience is who's seeing the impression, you can find that inventory and effectively uh, make it premium or sell it for a higher uh, price. This may well lead to the creation of a sort of new category uh, called programmatic uh, premium. Um, which maybe it's not $30 CPMs, but it's going to be certainly north of $1.25, more in the high single digit range. And as well, technology providers are helping even publishers with their direct sales by helping them understand inventory availability, predict 
what's going to happen in the future so that we can develop more of what we see in more linear media channels, a futures market, or other commonly referred to as uh, an upfront. That is a very exciting uh, development because I think uh, it's, so far it's helped advertisers. If it helps publishers as well, it'll uh, give growth to the, uh, to the ecosystem. The other um, issue, though, is all of this RTB and audience-based media buying so far has not really sort of addressed upper funnel advertising objectives. I'm talking about you know, the, the, the brand guys. And let's face it, um, that's where the dollars are, right? I mean, there are, there are tens and tens of billions of dollars in those upper uh, funnel areas where brand advertisers who heretofore have barely made any kind of a, uh, any kind of a spend commitment in the digital uh, channels. And when Google talks about, uh, when Eric Schmidt came out and said, well, there's a you know, display, broadly defined, including video, could be a $200 billion market in a few years, he was really uh, uh, necessarily suggesting that we would have to, in fact, tap into those those brand dollars in order, to, uh, in order to get there. So today, unfortunately, you know, 99% of ad tech is focused at the bottom of the funnel. There's a good reason it has, because it's like you know, easy money, so to speak, right? It's like simple math. When you have performance media, when you can determine uh, the, uh, the return on investment with, with a high degree of uh, assurance to the advertiser, you know, you can do that best at the bottom of the funnel. It's a little fuzzier as you go up the funnel. The standards and definitions of what, what is success obviously are, need to be worked on, but we're now seeing companies in the demand side and the supply side of technology providers helping with, uh, we're starting the start of uh, um, uh, some tools and analytics to help with some of those uh, upper funnel uh, goals. And we're going, and, and it's not just the different sort of channels of, of digital, uh, yes, there, you know, we, we, companies are taking a more holistic view on their spend. They're thinking about their search campaigns in conjunction with their display campaigns and tying in video, and they'll have a mobile aspect of their strategy as well. So this is becoming more comprehensive, not just in display, but also you know, leveraging uh, offline channels uh, as well, since they're all uh, in one way or another becoming digitally uh, addressable. But it doesn't even stop there. Uh, we're seeing the data available about audiences that you know, heretofore had sort of been a search and display uh, sort of uh, bailiwick, all of a sudden get applied in areas from obviously e-commerce we've seen to lead generation and sales support, CRM, even content management is leveraging this same data pool about audiences that we're now able to A, collect, and B, have the sort of algorithms and technology to be able to uh, do something about it or discern uh, information about it. This is exciting, as we'll talk about, because it's bringing a whole bunch of new players uh, into, the, uh, into the marketplace. And, and yes, big data um, is, uh, is an interesting concept. It's probably an overused uh, term. But um, it, it has a big implication in, in advertising. We're seeing, just to mix, uh, just to mix movie metaphors, um, we, we, yes, big data wins. But as I mentioned previously, we've got you know, these four titans uh, in, um, in, in Apple, um, Facebook, Google, and, and Amazon which have these such phenomenal uh, um, data sets that they're able to leverage. And the question will be, you know, what share of wallet, what share of eyeballs will they command, and will they, in fact, squeeze out a more, a more independent web? And you know, speaking of Facebook, they're now over one-third of people's time you know, and growing. That is a phenomenal uh, uh, opportunity for them. They have uh, the data, you know, very interesting data about what people share and what their interests are. And to date, they have sort of kept that data fairly, fairly tight. They've got a very efficient buying program on the front end with an API, and, and they have this incredible uh, data pool. It'll be interesting to see how they play with other publishers in the ecosystem and whether they decide to create a business outside of the premises of Facebook. You know, arguably, they could develop a much more efficient AdSense um, and, and be a, a huge uh, ad network. But it's not all good news, as I mentioned. Uh, Lane's got some, Lane's got some, uh, some, some challenging news.
because one could argue, like the show, which is uh, you know a dark uh, drama with all kinds of issues, um, that uh, this industry too faces uh, faces its demons. Uh, I would argue that fragmentation is not really the issue; duplication is the issue. Take, for example, three technology companies doing eh, roughly the same thing. Okay, fine. Uh, there are mousetraps with different types of cheeses, but it's essentially you know they're performing the same functionality. They'll do a Series A round, you know, to build out the tech, and once they've got that proven, they do a Series B round, hire a biz dev person, maybe go after you know, publishers or advertisers, and then maybe they'll do a Series C round in order to build out a sales force and actually build a company with HR and, and, and so forth. Well, it's a lot of money, and it's not just three mousetraps. We've got hundreds of them, as you can see in the Lumascape. And the problem this creates is that you know, you've got hundreds of people now calling on these principles, the advertiser or the agency rep or the publisher selling what is in effect a similar or the same, same solution. This is not sustainable, right? Um, uh, and, and, and we need to solve for this sort of you know, duplication um, in, that's occurring uh, in the industry. Heck, the people at the principals don't even have the time to have all the meetings with the various uh, vendors. So, and, and not all of these companies you know, are, will, will make it, right? Not all of them uh, will survive. It was always easy. In the last five years, we've seen so much venture capital interest in this sector that all I had to do was just do another round. You could always just raise more money. The only implication would be some incremental dilution. Well, that, ladies and gentlemen, has come to an end. Um, uh, venture money has dried up. Uh, Obviously, there'll still be funding for interesting, high-growth uh, new opportunities. But for a lot of companies, in particular the Me Too's, the duplicative uh, technology providers, we're seeing a tightening of the fist. And that's a good thing. It's a good thing for the industry, because it'll cause a rationalization of some of these companies. I'm calling 2012 the year of the capitulation, where companies that are going to be running out of cash will have to do a private merger with another company just in order to you know, stay, uh, stay in the game. You could think of it, uh, you know, and, and by the way, one solution may be standardization. Um, boy, wouldn't it be great if there was an advertising operating system, right? Something that companies, rather than have to build out a whole company, they could in fact just leverage a platform of others. Obviously, Google uh, has an ecosystem-wide uh, presence, but let's face it, they're player coach. Um, others, like MediaOcean, have developed this sort of, or have announced that they're uh, building an OS upon which others can build apps for. And now AppNexus, MediaMath, PubMedic, others are getting in the game and announcing uh, their platforms as well. Uh, by the way, this isn't just nomenclature. You can't, everyone can't be a platform, right? That just, that obviously just uh, won't work. Um, but it's also driving uh, m and um, and again, some of them are being forced into it. Others have huge opportunities. Take a look at the amount of transactions that have occurred just in the last three years. We've seen huge growth since the financial crisis in 2009. And just last year, over 132, uh, 132 transactions across the various uh, Lumascapes, including uh, over 20 uh, deals in excess of $100 million. So we're really starting to see that sort of consolidation, which is one of the solutions to what's uh, otherwise a fragmented and duplicated uh, system. You could think of it, uh, and, and by the way, the buyers are, of course, the usual suspects with Google leading the way. But what's most interesting is we have this outer rings, this universe of other companies from media, marketing, technology, software, commerce, and network, all of which for the stated reasons, uh, previously stated reasons about the applicability of data in these other applications are now interested in ad tech companies. You could almost think of it as like a, as a, as a race. You've got the strategic buyers trying to figure out what they need and the growth companies. And, and, and unless they run out of money, you know, eventually you're going to have some very successful um, transactions occur for some, and I repeat, some, um, of these uh, of these businesses where we find a match, and that's what uh, that's obviously what uh, what we do. Now, IPOs. One could say, boy, you know, rather than just a strategic exit, perhaps we could go public. Public markets are open again. We've seen a lot of transactions in the last year. I would argue that in ad tech, it'll be interesting to see because. If you think of companies in the IPO public markets on a spectrum, you've got, let's say, enterprise software at one end, 
and consumer internet on the other end, where in enterprise software, you've got this rich history of companies at robust valuations, four, five, six plus times revenues that have successfully gone public. Uh, they have a B2B model, but they have recurring revenue. They have multi-year contracts. And, and like I said, a strong track record. On the other end, you got consumer internet, very popular names, demand outstrips supply for these stocks. And obviously with Facebook on the way, that's gonna drive further. This is B2C, the really sexy stuff, but it's sort of more campaign-based revenues as opposed to contractual. Ad tech oddly sits in the middle where it's you know, got the sort of downside of B2B like enterprise and yet the uh, campaign driven revenues like consumer. And so far there haven't been a lot of success names in terms of public companies. Uh, uh, yes, Millennial Media went out, but that clearly with the small float and the only sort of game in town on, on uh, mobile, that's really what was driving that. It'll be very interesting to see how Exponential uh, does in the marketplace uh, this summer. So, um, just <laughs> and just to, to finish, and of course that's sort of uh, exactly what, uh, what we do, uh, we advise companies um, at the intersection, either helping the big guys, the strategic guys, figure out where they need to, to go, and then figuring out a matchup. We usually then um, represent the, uh, the target company in getting these uh, connections that hopefully uh, make a lot more sense. And with that, I thank you. Hello, come on over here, let's get some questions. We've got mics uh, there and there and there. And come on up if you've got a question for Terry. Let me ask the first question, which is who, uh, are you willing to go out on a limb and talk about who you think is vulnerable in particular right now to the various market forces that you're talking about? And just to tee it up, we have a session tomorrow morning which you alluded to at the beginning of your presentation, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google. Two guys coming out of a garage with something, who should be worried most about some people coming out of a garage? Well, well, the interesting thing is these big companies, I mean, they have this established set of, you know, they, they have, media used to be about walls, right? Defensible walls and licenses, and then we sort of went away, and now these guys are sort of reconstructing their walls again. So they've actually got a fairly strong sort of set of defenses. That said, look in the, just in the last year, the growth of companies like Pinterest and Instagram, it turns out that even in this world with, with these huge titans, we still can have two guys in a garage that can build a company that gets very, very substantial growth overnight. Do you know that Rovio was all of 12 people in a Helsinki warehouse in 2009, and now it's distributed across over 450 million people? Um, all right, for house rules, everybody, you gotta tell us your name and who you work for. Please, tell us who you are. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Serge. I'm sales director of ZBTLC company, uh, the IT company that produces software. Uh, Terence, uh, thanks a lot for this uh, great uh, keynote presentation. Uh, my question is uh, about, um, you spoke about uh, RTB ad exchanges. Uh, this is very interesting. This is where uh, a lot of advertisers and companies want to work. Uh, but the issue that we faced uh, with uh, that uh, we cannot directly as uh, work as advertiser uh, with uh, the ad exchanges on RTB platform. Uh, we should uh, use uh, either DSP or some other options, uh, but uh, it's not uh, the thing that I'm looking for. Uh, what can you tell me about that and what, what are the ways uh, that we could uh, uh, go to the ad exchange and uh, use RTB. Thanks. Sure. So uh, we're, obviously this is still fairly early, right? This, this didn't exist in 2009, so we're in a third year development of this entire aspect of the, of the display channel. And what I'll tell you is that we've got a lot of intermediaries that help you know, the big agencies with the, with the, with the large amounts of, of spend. And, and usually, you know, through agencies, through their trading desks, you can, you can get on board. There's also smaller DSPs that help uh, marketers that are you know, not as large with more SMB oriented marketers that can help them, in fact, you know, take advantage of these exchange, uh, efficient exchange marketplaces for media buying on a much, much smaller scale. So I think there's players across the ecosystem that can help any size player. Uh, talk about activity. What's happening right now? Is it? Is it? I mean, you, you were talking earlier about uh, venture capital drying up and for some places, but not for others. Like, what, what? What's it like in general? And what are you excited about? And is there an eighth loom escape coming out that will be about you know email or something? So. Uh, that's, you're a good straight man. Um, so uh, there is a lot of activity right now, and, and interestingly, even in, in display, in, um, 
in the traditional uh, uh, one, the channel that's been around for a long time. We're seeing interest in, believe it, ad networks. Uh, Yahoo bought uh, InterClick last year. Uh, I would prognosticate that we'll see more in, uh, in ad network uh, M&A uh, this year. Uh, the technology providers, look, what we're seeing is it, the distinction between a DSP and an SSP and an ad, who cares what it's called? They're all sort of technology-enabled marketing services companies, and they're all developing a similar set of capabilities. And, and folks on the outside, when you see a chart like the growth of that RTB that we saw earlier, there is no question why, whether it's you know, offline marketing uh, folks, uh, who are in other but related channels where they can leverage their CRM and their customer data into this channel, they're absolutely going to be going to be acting. And is there another LumaScape coming? And there is another LumaScape coming. It's a marketing technology uh, LumaScape because what we found was, you know, again, on this point of the broadening universe of people interested in this category and in the kind of data that gets uh, collected, uh, on the consumer, uh, you've got companies that are doing email, that are doing CRM, that, are, that have uh, you know, large chunks of offline data, that, uh, and software companies. And those will be included in uh, the uh, marketing technology automation LumaScape. So I saw people uh, taking out their phones. In fact, I saw someone doing just now and taking pictures of, of the LumaScape. And yet, I believe that they're all there on your website. Can you give there, us the URL one more time? It's uh, lumapartners.com, and you go to the resource section, you can download a high res of any of the Lumascapes. And we try and keep them as up to date um, as possible. There's obviously a lot of activity, new companies being born, and of course, uh, thankfully, uh, companies being bought. Terry, thank you so very much. Let's give him a big round of applause, thank everybody. You, Terry Kowadra, thank you so very much.